Okay, so you'll see that this guy needs a couple of things. It needs a surface to understand where drainage is occurring. It needs points. So the points are where the start of your drainage line is going to occur. Imagine the points is a drop of water that falls from the sky, and this is gonna record its entire drainage on the surface. The resolution and the calc determine the quality of that line. So you could have it as a very kind of rigid uh, curve that's just made up of a couple of points, or it could be a very fluid line that has like thousands of points that kind of uh, go every couple inches or something. So that's what we have our resolutions and our calc. So resolution says how close the points are or how many points there are, and then the calc is the length of the curve. So we could uh, determine how long these drainage lines are going to be because if they get, if you want the drainage lines to be really long but it's a short distance, they'll just start to kind of curl up uh, at the end of the surface and it'll look kind of weird. Uh, and you'll see that in this example. So something we probably want to do too, it's, I mean, you could do it for your entire site or you could do it for just, um, sorry, this entire surface or just your site area. So I'll show you how we want to do that. So I'm gonna go back to my top view. It's okay if we wanna just reference the entire surface. So I'm gonna use this patch guy. So this is how we created our surface. And I'm gonna drag him into here. It's remember to use an actual surface versus the mesh because this does make a difference. Um, if this is specifying a surface and you try to plug in a mesh, it most likely won't work. Then we can start to control the points. So like I said, I just want to figure out the points within this area. So I'm just going to, in Rhino, draw a rectangle. And I'm just going to kind of give it a some type of distance to cover the entire space. All right, so I just draw a rectangle that takes up all of our site, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and reference. So I'm gonna take that surface. I'm going to go to the surface uh, tab here, divide the surface to a bunch of points. And this is where we can start to control um, the resolution or how much raindrops we're gonna have. So we can see, I'll move this up so we can see it a little bit better. All right, so these are essentially starting to simulate our rain droplets. So this has some level of detail or density, but we can even control how many points we want so we can even increase that. So let's try with 15. I'm going to keep it pretty uniform in both directions. So this, by plugging in a slider to this U and V for the surface divide, I can change like how many drops of rain I want to simulate. Probably don't need that many. So you can start off with something kind of modest. So let's just see what 15 looks like. What's great is that you could actually have them kind of floating above and it'll still allow for the script to work. It'll actually kind of simulate the water dropping onto the surface. Um, so here, again, this is where it comes to branching. If I pull into here, I see that these are dashed. So these are all kind of in their own separate branch depending on that direction. So I want to flatten this. So I'm going to right click, flatten, get rid of that. I'm going to drag this into here, and let's see what it's saying. So now we have to include our resolution on our calc, and I'll show you, and let's see what that does. So let's try something like 0.25 for the resolution. So I think this simulates essentially every... Uh, 0.25 of a foot or every three inches. Let's do 50 for our calc. 
And now we start to see these crazy lines. So it's probably a little too much. So let's modify these. Probably don't need nearly as much, right? So you'll have to kind of play around to see what's going to give you the best quality of these. If you don't like that, it's kind of like coming down like hair. Let's actually project these onto that surface. So I can take these points. Oops. I'll use project. I'm going to take these points, project them onto this geometry, so our surface. So now you'll see, let's turn this one off real quick. Now all those points are projected onto that surface flush. So now let's see if that makes a difference. But before you did that, that was, it still had that same shape Yeah, okay. exactly. So this literally just kind of stamps it onto that surface. Yeah, but you can see now it's actually like following the topography now. Nope, you'll see so. So it kind of understand like if you, when you have that surface there, if I put it below, oh, maybe it's probably best to have it on top. You could <laughs> specify a direction. It just defaults, I think, to the downward direction. So yeah, if you want that surface to be below for some reason, just make sure that the direction is in the Y instead of the negative Y or Z versus negative Z. Okay, so now let's see what these flow lines look like. Oh, that's a little better, right? So we can see again, there's actually some interesting things happening. So, Again, we have that drainage is going from the corner of the lot. It starts to pour down, but then there is a dividing point, right? Some of it starts to pour towards the street, and then the other part starts to uh, pour towards the golf course, right? There's even this area that kind of has a direction that's just continuously going this way. We could probably just ignore that because we have the houses there. But it's probably good to know that these ones are not going to make it down to the golf course. Uh, they're probably going to go towards the street. So how you address those two conditions is going to be um, unique. So let's. So I'll show you exactly what these um, parts are doing. So if I look at these curves, and let's let's see what happens if I make it a so I'm going to use this toggle to P line and hit true. Shouldn't make a huge difference. So let's keep that false. And I'll, let's see what these curves actually look like. So I'm going to go to my curve analysis and look at their control points. So you can see these are pretty much how these curves are being created. Let's turn off this one. Right, so you can see how many points are making up each one of these based off of this. If I change that value versus this one. So the, the one that's going into the res is changing, again, the resolution of these lines. So it's determining if it's really low, that means there's not a lot of points actually. The higher, the more points you start to create and that's what creates that fluid quality. So let's actually do something a little bit higher for our resolution, right? So that's looking much more flush. Well, it's looking really good, actually. So, but every time you increase the resolution or the number of points, it starts to get shorter because it only understands that the um, it can go a certain distance. So that's why you use this larger slider for your calc. So now we can start to see that these look a lot more realistic.
right? So that looks much better than before. There's none of that kind of real swaying or uh, movement of like them starting to kind of buckle. You could start to see a very kind of fluid motion. Yeah, exactly. So see like the dump, uh, one that's going into the resolution, that's what's determining the quality of that curve. So if I have a really low, it starts to look kind of weird. See how it's like going to create these squiggly lines versus when I increase that, it starts to smooth those out. And then if I, obviously the higher resolution, the shorter it's gonna be because it's only understanding uh, this many calculations. So essentially what this is saying is that there's going to be only eight segments. And so you obviously wanna have more segments and this determines their detail. So this is how you start to show. Now, as you see how I'm changing the slider, have you guys, I know you guys are familiar with making animations in Rhino, right? Mm -hmm. Have you done it with Grasshopper? Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So you can literally use this slider itself just to make an animation of drainage lines, right? If I just drag it, you can watch how they start to flow, right? Which becomes pretty cool. Okay. So that's all you have to do for your drainage lines um, in this process. Any questions so far? General questions? No, um, no uh, how come sometimes the, the flow from my uh, so for some reason so the it likes to go under the dash channel? Again, general questions. Um, all right. Something we can start to do again, just like how we're giving uh, the topography some color. You might want to show the lines as being blue. It depends because most likely this is going to make its way into Illustrator where you can assign the colors. If you want to kind of keep it in this grasshopper, you can give them their own separate colors as well. Um, let's see. So another thing, and this is something you want to start to indicate too, is where the water starts to enter your site versus where it leaves the site, right? It's important to understand that we are essentially contributing water to not only our own uh, boundary lines, but anything that leaves our site. So it's important to start to think about um, how much of this water begins to either go onto the street or go into the golf course? How can we start to manage that? And I'm not saying we have to understand all the quantified values at this point, but it is good to start to know that looking at this, what would you say, or how many different drainage classifications would you have for your site? Four, which, so what are four? What are the four? Yeah. Uh, the ones that going to the golf course? Okay. This one? Okay. This one? Okay. Sure. So I wasn't even really thinking about these ones that are just on the outskirts, but that is something that I think we could certainly be aware of, right? So we can kind of group these and maybe they get their own kind of color coordinating system. Uh, This is act, these are the high points and these are the, so that's probably a good thing to know too, right? Like I only understand that because I could see that this is sloping this way, but we probably do. So if someone were to just be looking at this, they probably wouldn't know 
where the high points and low points are. There are some indicators of that, though. When you can start to see that the lines start to become grouped together, that, that's rare that it happens from an uphill to a downhill. That's usually indicative of it going from uphill to downhill. Again, like if you aren't familiar looking at drainage lines, you probably don't realize that. But it is good to kind of just be very clear on some of these things. So that's another thing that we can indicate in this graph too, right, is the high points and the low points of these lines. So what's good is that we can stick within this curve tab. We could then uh, go to our analysis and look at the endpoints. So if I drag this, now I'll see where the start of the line, where the start is versus where the end is. And it's got them nicely uh, grouped that way. So when it comes to, again, the, the editing and the the visual of that, we can give them their own color coordination. So let's actually look at some ways to classify that. So instead of seeing them as just a single band of a color, let's start to kind of graphically, again, show them having um, some unique qualities to them. So a couple ways we can do that. So we can take these curves and we can fragment them. Let's try it this way. So let's divide these by, well, let's just divide them evenly. So. I'm going to divide the curve. This essentially defaults to 10 segments or 11 points. So there's the start, the end, and then there's nine in between. We can use this to uh, begin to actually fracture these curves and assign them. Maybe there's a darker or a lighter tone at the start and then a darker tone at the bottom. Let's also change or turn this off so we don't have so much conflicting colors. So I'm going to use the display component. Whatever that is. custom preview, grab that into there, and we'll just have it as a white background for now. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to fragment all these curves and give them all their own kind of unique color. So I'll divide it by these segments, and I can increase this if I want. I'll go back to this curve, and you'll see that there's also this component to shatter it. So I'll take these curves. It's asking then for this parameter, so this lowercase t. You'll see that this also provides that lowercase t. And this is literally going to make what one of these drainage lines looks like. Instead of it being one solid line, now it's 10 segments of the line. So that's where you'll see when I'm looking at this, that there's number of 10, right? So that's number of segments per curve. So let's turn this off. And this is where I can, again, uh, give them their own color. So the way these are going to work is that they're essentially, they all have their own kind of index. So the first, whether it's this line or this line or any of these lines, every curve at the start, that first segment, is has an index of zero. So these all have an index zero. The next segment has an index of one, index two, three, four, etc. So that's how, again, this data is being 
uh, organized. So that's how we can use, uh, that's what we can use to start to kind of color these segments. So I'm going to now give them a similar kind of color gradient. So I'm going to go to parameters, gradient again. So I need to know what that lower limit is. That one's always going to be, in this case, zero. And then I'm going to create a slider that's got some higher numbers. I'm going to drag that as to my other limit. So now it's got that many segments. And this will now be the upper limit. So that way, if I want to increase or lower, that that's just going to also respond to it. And then it needs to know that series, so it's literally just going from zero to whatever that number is. Yeah, I know this is probably one of the more kind of abstract understandings of this, but so I can use this series component. So I just want it to start at zero, just like how these lists have a zero. The step size is one, because they just go from zero, one, two, three, four, so forth and so on. And then I need to know the count, which is going to be the same value. And you'll see what this creates is just a series of numbers going from 0 to 14. So I'll drag that into here. And now when I display these, I might have to graph this too, but we'll see. Let's turn off all these things that are analyzing it. So you can see it's hard to tell, but it does go from like a pink to a dark red. So let's just change that a little. Again, dealing with drainage, so Maybe we want to use a more appropriate color, such as blue. So let's just, I can always customize these colors by clicking on them. Let's go with like a really dark blue. Come on. This is really not liking it, but oh well. So you can see now it's a little bit more of a dramatic change. So I'll right click, let's go to this more pastel -y looking blue. Again, the more contrast you can have, the better. And I'll just kind of drag these to be all the way to their edges. Come on. <clears throat> this computer is just not liking all this processing information. Maybe it's just going to stop. There we go. All right. So we finally got some. Now some color gradients for our drainage line. So let's see what that looks like. And I think it works well too, because again, like when they're spread out, uh, they're lighter, but then we can really start to see where they kind of collect out because now there's a huge kind of lighter swatch of a darker color that contrasts more uh, with the rest of the site, right? So that becomes a little more dynamic in its visual. And that's why we can do the same thing 
Again, if this wasn't lagging so bad, let's just disable some of this because it's still processing it. I don't know, it's somehow like that a whole. So, again, to kind of reinforce where the start of it is versus the end of it is, we can look at those starting endpoints of the curve and give them those similar colors. So, I'm going to go to curve, endpoints, Instead of it just being these X's that are just displays, we could give them a circle. So the star could have one size and color for the color, for the circle. Um, so I'm gonna, again, click on this or right click on it to get its color values. So it's one, six, three, 49. <clears throat> I'll go to create a custom color. So input color swatch, I can click on here. Then I can just drag it to one, six, Fortunately, I can't just manually, so I'll just get it close. That's close. And then 49. All right, that's pretty good. So again, I'll just do that's, um, preview. Instead of it just being a circled curve, I can even make it a surface. I'll use the boundary surface, drag that into there. Drag him into the geometry, swatch. So now I can see it's again, pretty light, but there's the start of my drainage. Now I'm going to do this opposite for the end ones. So I can literally just copy and paste and just have to change that color. I'll right click so that's 23886. Yeah, and as long as it's close. And saturation was at a hundred, except. And instead of being also the start, now it's the end. Maybe these ones are looking a little bit bigger as the water's collected in those areas. So that could be have a slightly higher radius. Again, it's kind of a subjective preview of that. So. So let's see what this looks like on a black background now. So let's turn off this. So it's kind of crazy with everything else underneath it, but if I go to perspective and see what this looks like now. So you would have to, again, we'll include this as some of the final deliverables is every time you're creating these kind of graphics, we want to make sure that there's also some type of legend. So you can indicate the legend for what the drainage lines look like, where the start is, where the end point is, or the high point and low points. But this is how you can start to, again, create these drainage lines for your site now. Okay. 
Any other questions? Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop that there then.